So we're going to take a walk through history. Some of you guys know that I am the oldest one in the room. I actually started recruiting in 1978. I actually started out in industry in 19... What is this going on here? This cannot, I'm going to have to do something here. I can't... I'm going to do something that makes no sense to you guys, but it makes perfect sense to me because I'm getting buzzed by my outlook. Um, and I can't deal with it. It's... I should. I thought I turned everything off, but Outlook doesn't has a mind of its own. Um, so here's our here's our agenda. I'm going to give you a walk through sourcing history, recruiting history from. Now I did work in the living. I did work for a living. I was engineer actually for three years, and I got an MBA, and I got a manager, and I started running a company, and then I decided I love recruiting more than anything. Uh, it was also more lucrative than working 80 hours a week. Still work 80 hours a week, but neither here nor there. But I want to give you a walk, and I think there's things that we did in the olden days that we're forgetting today. Uh, one of the things we forget is that we're not really aligning strategy and tactics. I think everybody wants to hire, let me just, this is a question in chat. How many of you want to hire top-notch passive candidates? Just say yes or no, I want to get everybody engaged here so we got the full group of 100 people responding. How many of you want to hire top-notch, you can, if you don't want to hire top-notch candidates, um, well, you can still find out how not to do it here too. It's the exact opposite of what we're going to do. So everybody wants to. But I'm going to contend that we go out of it backwards. We, we make it too difficult. I'm actually going to contend that most companies actually set their processes up to hire average candidates and hope that a good person falls through the cracks. My position is the default process should be how good people look for work and maybe some bad candidates fall through the cracks. But we don't work it that way. But if, let me say this. If you get more resumes of bad candidates than good candidates, you got the wrong strategy. I will show you how to realign that. We'll focus on what I call early bird sourcing. Good candidates have a specific need before they enter the market in the moment they do. And if you've really got a strategy developed, you're focusing on people, active candidates the day they enter the market or passive candidates before they do. We'll talk obviously about this recruiter competency model and how all this ties together. We'll give you some idea on how you rank yourself. And then we'll show you how you can uh, realign your passive candidate, uh, your, excuse me, your social media for passive candidates. Uh, and then what you can do next. So that's where we're going. Uh, I'm, I can see in the corner of my eye that questions coming in. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them. But I want to give you a history of where I've been. And it's an interesting history because I did really start in recruiting in 1978. And literally, I did work for, I did work for a living. I was 10 years. And I had a very, very nice career. I just decided I was doing a lot of hiring, a lot of recruiting. And I liked that as well as running the company. And I just decided, hey, I really, the reason I left industry is I hated my boss. Loved the job, hated my boss, decided to work with very successful recruiters, and I struggled the first six months. After that, I said, hey, this is actually a good business. And it was, so there's a lot of commonalities, although you wouldn't see them right away. But I'm going to go back to early 1980s, the pre-internet. This is 10 years before the internet, maybe 15. And I put this up in the upper left here. Companies, a classified ad, which is the equivalent of a posting, never posted the job description. And most people say, what are you talking about? Yeah, all we did is, all the, if you're posting an ad in the Sunday Times or the paper, the classified ads, you didn't have time to post the whole job description. You just had a little two-by-two, two, a two-inch column and a two-inch ad. You put the title, the name of the company, and some compelling message. Secretary, or whatever it was, it was just, it was the least, it was, it was probably less characters than a tweet because you sold by the letters. Uh, then on Sunday and Thursday, you had these big display ads. In fact, I, my first job, I looked at the Sunday LA Times. Hughes Aircraft Company was hiring engineers for a whole new host of projects. It looked pretty cool. It was closer to Manhattan Beach where I lived, and I was working out in Anaheim. Hey, cool, I'll apply there. A week later, I had a job working in a, still on missiles, but different job, and it was closer to home. And all it said was uh, mechanical engineers, control systems, work on this new anti-tank weapon system be part of defending America. That was it. I that's pretty cool. I'll do that. No more, no details. No, must have this, must. Didn't have any of that stuff. Uh, now, as a recruiter, I became a recruiter in about 1978, so that's when it started. Hey, there was a hidden job market. It wasn't that hidden. You looked in the Sunday paper, and there were some jobs, and you'd follow up, and you'd call companies. But it was only, it was one, one time. It wasn't 24-7. You saw the ad there, and it was there. Candidates, you didn't have any other than a Rolodex, and I had a Rolodex. You had candidates. Everything was time sensitive. You could find the person at that moment he or she was looking. So that's really, I had to say, what really changed with the Internet, it became 
It wasn't just one at a time. Uh, but there were big display ads that were much more focused on getting people's attention. It was advertising based and it wasn't need based. Then job boards came up and changed the game. And I think they made a huge, huge, huge mistake. It was 24-7 and instead of posting a little compelling message, they posted a bunch of garbage. You must have 17 years of this, 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 and then somebody at Monster said, post everything. Which to me was the dumbest thing you ever could do. Because now you had postings 24-7 of skills. It no longer was a career. And to me that was a huge loss. And then it was the idea of let's apply and screen out. We'll get hundreds of people applying, we'll screen out the worst. And I think that happened in early, late, let's I call it the when job boards came out in the 90s, early 90s. And that mentality stuck, stuck. And it's silly. We now have a philosophy of let's get as many bad candidates as we can, or it's or I call it the surplus of candidates model. Let's get thousands of resumes and hopefully a good one falls through the cracks. And we, in HR, was sold the bill of goods. Us recruiters, we did our thing and we knew it wasn't going to work. Uh, but then in the late, the mid to late 90s, something did happen to third party recruiters. I, I was a retained recruiter at the time, so it didn't really matter. I shifted to retained search in the late 80s, early 90s. But recruiters said, hey, now they've got all these postings, we don't need to pay third party recruiters for the same candidate. So they brought in contract recruiters. That was a game changer. Oh, so the job boards was a game changer in the wrong way. Contract recruiters was a game changer. But now they gave them too many reps. But now things started changing in the mid to, let's say, 2001, 2005. Google came in and aggregators came in. So companies, when you really thought about it, didn't go to your career website or candidates. They went to the aggregators. So search engine optimization became the game. But we still posted boring jobs. We still got stuck on this job description, which was uh, Monster Career Builder created it, which to me was a huge mistake. Then uh, Jobs to Web came along and said, hey, you know, search engine optimization. If you're going to hire people off the internet, you got to get there first. And they graded great, great technology to get there first. Uh, and they had the idea of let's not post individual jobs. Let's put hubs. Hey, if you want to be in retail, if you want to be an engineer, if you want to be this, you get to a landing page and then you're funneled to a specific job from the landing page. Interesting, guys. That's exactly what it was on the Sunday paper. Hughes Aircraft Company bought a whole page, and you saw 50 jobs on it. If you like one of them, you apply. And then they called you back and said, hey, you look pretty cool. Come on in. But they weren't. They were selling the title of the job and the mission and the project. I happened to be on two projects, Minuteman Missile, and then I worked on an anti-tank weapon system. Uh, then I got into finance and accounting and manufacturing and logistics, but neither here nor there. Uh, it was different. And it's actually the same old days. Jobs Web just figured out how to automate that. Then it started getting better. Now we have uh, the social media, got LinkedIn, Facebook, Google+, Twitter. Uh, and now the idea is, hey, let's interact with our employees. They've got big networks. So we're a lot, and we're not going to get into all the specifics of it. But now it's let's drive jobs through our employees. And job, Jobvite does a great job. LinkedIn does a great job on those things. Interesting things start to happen. Uh, we now build five years ago, or three years ago, it was a talent pool. The next three years, it will be what I call a virtual talent community. And we'll highlight that briefly today. It's the idea is those who have the deepest networks through their employees will win the game in the next two to three years. I don't know what's going to happen after that, but certainly yeah, there's no question that's going to happen. Because all that interactivity of through social media is, if you can connect with your employees, now it's not just 24-7, it's 360 24-7. Every job is connected with every a great person in the world through your employees full time, which there's a negative to that. I think if the market was hot, people start changing jobs for the wrong reason. You get turnover, and you know I think it has a, and I can't prove this, but I believe some of our economic malaise is because we have made it easy for people to change jobs. Companies have become less loyal. I'm not going to go cause and effect there, but there's some other secondary and tertiary issues here that when you start thinking about it, we've created a monster here. I mean, it's over. Back in the old days, you know, you actually thought about changing a job. It wasn't easy to do. Now we've created job changing is almost frictionless, and I think we've, we've had done some economic damage as a result. Subject for my retirement, so let's move on. Uh, but interestingly, about a month ago, <coughs> I think it was right a week or two before Thanksgiving. It could have actually been the week before Thanksgiving. Sunday Times, 
Los Angeles Times. I think that's the only one where they did it. The back page of the LA Extra section, full page. This is the full page ad. Northeastern University. And it reminded me of the good old days. Here was the title. We're searching the world for 200 innovative scholars. Northeastern University. If you read the content down here, it says Northeastern University is expanding faculty expertise aligned with research that addresses global imperatives, including grand challenges in health, security, and sustainability. I got to tell you guys, I saw that. And I remember seeing this ad on the LA Times. It said Hughes Aircraft has just won major contracts with a tow weapon system, this and this. If you want to accelerate your career, be part of the nation's new mission. And it was exactly the same ad 30 years later, maybe 35 years later. It was a landing page at Hub. This is what Jobs to Web created through Doug Berg, and they just got sold to Success Factors over the weekend. Uh, that's what they created. Let's get all the best people, let's target the best people, and wean out the worst. Let's not get everybody and hopefully do it and fall through the cracks. And if you're posting job descriptions, you're, weaning, you're, you're attracting people who are desperate, hopefully a good one is desperate too. And I've made this message for, hey, I gotta tell you, this was not rocket science. It worked back pre-internet, and somehow people got the idea as, oh, we gotta post the job description. Big display ad that's focused on top talent is what you need to do. There's no skills listed here. The implication is, obviously, you've got to have to have a PhD or go to a PhD. You're going to be working on a global imperative. It's going to focus on health, security, and sustainability on a global level. But it doesn't say that. They describe what's going to happen with those skills and how you can use them. That's implied, but it's not stated. No reason I can't post a job that way and put the skills down in two-point type to meet OFCCP. What we've done is, what these people have done is they focused on the intrinsic motivator for a passive candidate. And every single ad you write, if you really want, and every person raise your hand, you want to do it, do you know the intrinsic motivator for that passive candidate who's not looking? What's going to get their attention? For me as a mechanical engineer at 23 years old, it was work, I knew it was close to home, it was three miles from my house in Manhattan Beach, California, and I was working on Anaheim, driving 40 miles every day. It was work on a great, cool project, helping the nation, and close to home. Regardless, that's what it was. Here, I ask what's the, what, in fact, this is the question, two questions here. Do you know the intrinsic motivator for your passive candidate? What's going to get their attention in 15 or 20 seconds? Because if you don't, you're going to work way too hard. And if you do, you're in the game for passive candidates. And that's what should be everything you do. Let me just stop. Any thoughts, comments, or questions on that? Feel free to ask. Guys, now we're into the questioning, how would you apply all the stuff we're talking about to your issues? It's right there, and it's not hard. It's common sense. What's not common sense is, I don't know, understand why anybody would post a job description. It makes no sense forever if you want to hire good people. Don't put any requirements down. Hey, we need a salesperson that can increase territory in the Northeast Territory from 1 million to 5 million over the next year. If you've got a track record of doing that stuff, send us a resume and tell, you how, tell us how you did it. Whatever. That's good enough for me, and I'll work. Okay, let me kind of talk about, now I'm going to get a little more specific as to proving my case is that while everybody on this call wants to hire great candidates, passive and or active, you really don't. You, you say that, but your strategy is not aligned with that mission, that talent acquisition mission of great people at our company. Think about it. We've got three groups of candidates. Let's just call them the three hubs. Active candidates people in your talent pool or virtual talent community and passive, passive prospects. Active candidates are looking for a job. Talent pool are kind of looking after on that virtual talent community is people connected through your employees. Then you got the passives. And there are ways to find these people. Active, in my mind, it's through a search engine optimization, so they see you're compelling out at the top. A talent pool is a compelling outbound message. A passive person is you find them on LinkedIn, you call them up and you give them a, or send them a compelling email. But whatever it is, it's a compelling message. And 27 of you knew the 20% said you had to have a compelling message to get their attention. Northeastern had a compelling message. Now, this is the, here's where I ask you a question. As long as these are top people, active, semi-active somewhere in the pool, or passive, when you get them on the phone, they always ask a few simple questions to see if they want to engage with you and with your company. What are the two or three things candidates ask when you get them on the phone and you say, hey, I'm looking for something, and what do they ask next to see if they're going to be engaged?
So what did candidates first ask you? Yeah, I think uh, Mark's got it. But leave on going. Where is it? Probably to see how right. There's three or four things. You got it. I mean, it's not hard. I mean, usually they don't ask about benefits on the first call. Uh, this is the first two minutes. Here's what they ask. I mean, I've been doing this for 30, I mean, literally 33 years now. This is what they asked in 1978. This is what I asked when I called that guy up at Hughes Aircraft Company and said, yeah, I'm interested. I had, was a good engineer, a good record and good track record and all that kind of stuff. So I asked these questions. What's the title? What's the company? I knew it was Hughes. What's the cop? Where is it located? What's the job? Tell me a little bit about it. Oh, yeah, I'm interested in that. Nope, not interested in that. Now, I want to go three weeks later for people who are top performers who have multiple offers who are not looking, but they have accepted your job and they thought about it hard, and they agonized, and they talked to their friends, they compared it to other things. Your manager got involved, you got involved, but at the end of the day, if you ask that person, why did you take this engineering job? Why did you take this sales manager job? Why did you take this software development job? Why did you take it? After they studied it completely, what's the criteria they used to study it completely afterwards? So put that in there. This is the actual criteria they used to accept it. It's different than the actual the criteria they used to engage, although it might be some overlap. Yep, I think you Mark hit it again. He's got the fastest keyboard here. Uh, challenge hiring manager growth. Exciting opportunity. Part of building a practice. Could be. But even what Ann said, I mean, it's because they're doing something that has an impact. And if you guys don't know this, I mean, you should think about this. is not what I'm about to show you is profound, although it might seem simple. Only four of you answered that. Interesting. But interesting, too. Here's pretty much what, again, 33 years, it hasn't changed. What they asked at the beginning, what they asked at the end has not changed at all. What's the career? What's the impact of the job? Is it work I want to do? Well, I want to work for that person. I don't want to work for that person. Depending how desperate the person is, these change. But assuming they weren't looking at mobile offers, these are the criteria. Now, money is usually on the list. Comp and work-life balance is on the list, but it's usually not number one. And a lot of these are on the list at the beginning, but they tend to, if the job is really a great career, they move down the list. And then the company culture and the mission. I want it to work. I mean, I thought that was a better job. The second job I had was better than the first job I had as an engineer. I want that was a better, it was just more fun uh, for me. Uh, but now I have some questions for you. We know that great candidates, we absolutely know they take it to the career opportunity. Number one, I don't care if you're active, passive, if you're not desperate and you want to take a job, you select it because it's the best career opportunity amongst you, the one you have or others you're competing with. So the first question I have for you and this, I'd like everyone to answer yes or no to this question, or maybe. Do your job postings and messages describe career moves or lateral transfers? If you list skills in your messages, you advertise lateral transfers. So look at your messages. Everyone said a great opportunity. And now here's what you guys said. 50% uh, said candidates want compelling uh, jobs or great career opportunities. Yeah. Well, Valerie, I want you to send me your... If you believe you're absolutely, I want Matthew and, and this to everybody. If you believe your postings describe great career opportunities, I want you to send them to me. And I will guarantee I will personally look at them and comment. Now, usually we have 10 or 12 people do these on these calls. And another 10 or 12 would do it. Actually, one or two actually are pretty good. The other ones, you just believe they're good. They're really not. A career opportunity does not list skills. Let me ask you this. And the criteria to accept, have you ever met someone who said, I'm taking this job because I'm going to get another year of doing the same work I've already done? No, they talk about, oh, I can do that because I like doing this work. I'm going to be doing it and I'm going to stretch what I already have. Now, it's enhancing their skills. I'll say that. But it's not to do the same thing. And if you have, if you have anywhere in there must have X years of experience or must have this, you are defining a lateral transfer, not a career move. Let's go on. Uh, now, I want to ask another question. When candidates ask, what's the title, what's the company, what's the comp, what's the location, what's the job, you must be able to adroitly change the conversation and not answer the question. You must be able to say, this job is not about the compensation. This job is about a career move. If this job offers you a great career move and an excellent comp, wouldn't it make sense to still talk five or ten minutes? And if you can't bridge the gap at every single time there, you're wasting your time going after passive candidates or top talent. 
every single recruiter in your company must be able to bridge the gap. I want to just show this here and I'll come back. Because if you can't bridge the gap, you're playing a 1 in 100 game. If you're pretty good at bridging the gap, you've got an employer brand, you're probably playing a 10 in, oops, you're probably playing a 10 in 100 game. If you start getting a good recruiter, you're at 50 to 75. I'm at 100%. And a good recruiters have been to our boot camp are at 75 to 100%. Every single person you connect with, you want to talk to. Because you know three weeks later, if you make that person an offer, they will not make the decision on those first five questions. They'll make it on if this is a great career. And you have to be able to do that. Everybody in your company has to be able to do it. And if they're not the right person, then you're going to net network with that person on LinkedIn, and you're going to cherry pick their connections. And before that calls over, you have three other great candidates who will call you back. Oh, no, you got to do it on a phone call. Well, you can do it by, well, here's a question. I Sarah asked, a very fair question. How do you bridge the gap on a message in LinkedIn? Well, you just say, hey, I'm looking for, I mean, I do that. I, I did an email, and I don't think I have it in this one. It said, it was an HR manager job or an HR director. We, we created the advertising for a client. And I said, an open message from the CEO of a Fortune 100 company to my next uh, team of HR managers. That was the subject, and it was came. I, we wrote it; didn't come to the CEO, but he, he. It was his mission. We have to have in my company. HR is a critical strategic asset. Right now, it's flawed. We need some great uh, HR managers to come here and change that perception and make our make HR a vital strategic asset to a company, focusing on great people. If you want to be part of that mission, connect with my recruiting team at such and such an address. Now, Sarah. Uh, do you think that is bridging the gap in the email? That's how you do it. Now, you have to do that in words, too, when you get the people on the phone. Now, it's got to be a true story. Uh, now, here's why I say that I, I'm very uncomfortable. I think I go over here. Let me kind of highlight where that change came in so you can see the bullet point arriving. I believe most companies, particularly if you advertise boring if you use job descriptions, I guarantee your mentality is we have a surplus of candidates model and uh, tactics. We have a strategy that's great people, but we're using the wrong model to fulfill it. You cannot use the, the workflow for an active candidate, the same work, recruiting workflow as you can for a passive candidate. A surplus of model, candidate's model does not work. The idea being is we, we'll post a boring job somewhere and hopefully a good person sees it. That's a surplus of candidate's model. A scarcity of talent model says is like I wrote that ad. Good people respond to different messages they will not apply. They need to talk to their hiring manager. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that goes through. You have to short circuit. Hey, we're going to have to pass some candidates. We know they do different things. So I always tell companies, why don't you make your passive candidate recruiting workflow your default strategy and eliminate uh, and make the active candidate surplus model an exception. But we have that reversed. That's why I say most companies really have it backwards. We've got to keep on going here. Uh, let me kind of go through. What, is there any, is one question there, JJ, that would be good? And don't answer Jeremy Langdon's. <laughs> Jeremy, okay. come on. I've answered that question 17 times for you. Um, here's how I would do it, Jeremy. I think it's Jeremy. I know. Maybe it's not. Uh, no, I don't think it is. It's a different Jeremy, but it's got the first four letters of the same. Uh, Hughes Aircraft Company has just won a $3 billion contract to develop the new state-of-the-art drone system. We're looking for optical engineers, mechanical engineers, hydraulic engineers, and software developers to change technology uh, to defend our country in the future. If you'd like to be part of that exciting mission, send us your resume or a profile on your LinkedIn profile with something you've accomplished that indicates that you're somebody who could be, like to be part of this team. That's not black and white, Jeremy. That's mission goals, and I've, I've, we've placed hundreds of engineers in fact, I just talked to a bunch of engineers last week. Uh, you give them an exciting project that pushes the envelope, they'll join. Nothing to do with black and white skills. But let's go on. I want to kind of just get into the psychology of this. We did a survey last year with LinkedIn and updated it this year. Pretty much the same people, a little 4,500 or so people. And we asked people where they were in their hiring cycle. Were they looking or not looking? And what would they be looking for if a recruiter called them? So that was basically the essence. And basically, it follows that blue line, which says that you know when you when you take a job, it starts off great, 
then it might flatten out, and at some point in time you get diminishing returns where you just decide to look. So that's what that curve shows, time, uh, growth and impact, and satisfaction. We discovered in this survey that 28% were super passive, but we've called a lot of them. They'll still talk to you if you're a credible recruiter to network for the future, meaning they wouldn't look. 40% were explorers, meaning uh, if you called them up and said, hey, would you open to talk about a great job, they would actually talk to you. And 40% of, and actually everybody passed that, but 40% uh, who weren't looking said they absolutely would. 15% uh, were tiptoes. Hold on one second, guys. I got to pull that Uh, 15 percent were tiptoes saying, hey, I'm not really looking, but I have contacted a few very close co-workers that I've worked with in the past and told them to keep an eye and ear out for me. So they've kind of, they're right there on the margin. Searchers and networkers have represented 9 percent in total. They, searchers, on day one, they decide, I'm going to look and they'll go to Google or an aggregator to find a job. Networkers, uh, they, they, that's a little bit later, they start calling people who they might know casually. Uh, and then we have only 8% of the, and these are all fully employed people, we, we, select, we selected down only fully employed, we're actually going to a company's career website and actually applying for a job. Only 8% were doing it the way you've designed your workflow. I'll say that again, only 8% of the fully employed candidates are doing it the way you've designed your workflow, which is apply and hopefully something, it's like playing the lottery. Well, why would a good person do it? And then I ask you, why would you guys design a workflow designed to go after 8% of the market? Now, 100% of the act of unemployed will do it, and 8% of the fully employed. I mean, I got to tell you guys, you got to be crazy to do that. People think I'm crazy by saying this. No, I think you're crazy to expect to get fully employed, active, uh, passive candidates using the workflow that none of them use. I mean, I got to tell you, anybody who designed that should be fired. I, it just doesn't make any sense to me, and it's so obvious, and I know you guys believe it, but you'll get sucked into the inertia of that's the way we've always done it. That's the way our lawyers tell us to do it. That's the way comp and benefit does it. BS, talk to a smart lawyer, and they'll tell you, no, you don't have to write a boring ad. You don't have to do that. You just believe, you've assumed that's what they said, so you take the course of least resistance. I'm so old now, I'm almost feeling like Barney Frank. I don't care who I offend anymore. Uh, I'm not a liberal though, but that's, let's take it from there. We'll stop the politics. So let's keep on going. Now, 83% you have to reach differently. 17% you are active in some way, but they're not going to follow your current workflow other than 8% of them. Uh, that's why I have this thing I call early birds. Get the people before they enter the market or the day they enter the market. So I like explorers, tiptoers, and searchers. That's the sweet spot for great talent. But explorer who's not looking must have a compelling career move, like I just described those couple of ads. Tiptoers, because they've reached out, you know, if they reach out, they still want a career move, but they, but since they've reached out, they've decided something's going on with their job, uh, so they'll take a better job. It's got to be a pretty good job, but they're going through a very narrow network. Searchers want a good job. Networkers will take a lateral transfer, so you're getting them, but you've got to get them through your employees. And hunters will take any job. So I go back to the point is, if you want great people, you've got to give them a great job. So I say, hey, build your workflow around the early birds. And if you want to know how well, oh, I'm sorry, JJ. Can I just finish this before you ask the question, unless it's critical? You, nope, you bet. Finish it. Yeah, let me just finish this because I was in the middle of it, but you can. I'll certainly do it. Uh, here's the way I would start figuring out where these people are. Uh, start ask. See, this is, this is a way, way to determine if your sourcing is any good or not. The messages might be bad, but at least you'll know your sourcing is effective. Just start asking every single candidate you've talked to how long they've been looking. And if they say, well, I just started, or I haven't, I, I just decided to come here because I'm not looking at all, uh, then you've, you're doing it well. But if they say, I've been looking for three or four weeks, and they've been looking for three or four weeks and they couldn't find you, i got to tell you, you're advertised, something's wrong. you got a fundamental flaw that these people are looking three to four weeks and they find you. Now, if you get a big employer brand, you get lazy. Oh, everybody's coming to us. Yeah, but are the right people coming to you? Maybe they are. If they're coming through a highly respected employee, I would, I would trust that more than I would uh, just coming off an ad, but neither here nor there. And the idea is if you're going after the early birds, you have to sell a career move. You've got to be able, and you've got to be able to over, bridge the gap when you do it. Now, JJ, what's, what's the question? Yeah, a lot of JJ? questions about, 
Yeah, can you hear me, Lou? I hear you, yeah. Yeah, perfect. A lot of questions about ads. Uh, why is uh, having such a compelling ad so important when such a high percentage of that sweet spot of the best people are going to be in the Explorer category who theoretically might not even be looking at an ad? Um, oh, the ad, oh, the that's a good, let me answer that. The ad, that's, an ad is not an ad. an ad. You're thinking of an ad as a job poster. My ad is a phone call, is an advertising message. Uh, my ad is an email you send out to people. So you got the pitch is the verbal pitch, the email message, uh, that letter I wrote to the HR people. That was kind of, hey, would you be open to talk about something? It was so compelling that people who were passive saw it or sent it to other people. So it, you got to think about messaging as uh, in social media. It could be a tweet. It could be an email. It could be a voicemail. I mean, so don't look at it just as a job posting as the message. What was the next question, JJ? Uh, next questions were actually about the structure of an ad. Uh, first of all, if you put the name of the company in your ad, are you nervous that the candidate is going to contact the employer directly? And then also, how do candidates today who have been trained to sort themselves out on skills and experience, how are they relating to your new compelling kind of ads? I guess I don't want those people. I, I guess I don't know where the proof came from. That's how act, that's how candidates are doing it. That's how active candidates are doing it. Uh, I don't know. That's a an assumption based on I suspect no data whatsoever. So I'm not going to buy into it because um, I've been working for 30 years and I've been sending messages like that HR message out, and there's they're responding to the impact. When you talk them up on the phone, they're responding to the impact. Just ask a candidate. Just call every single passive candidate you want and ask this question. Would you be open to explore a situation that's clearly superior to what you're doing today? Just ask them. People are passive. They'll say, yeah, sure. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to do next. You've got to go to our boot camp to do that, but we, we teach you how to bridge the gap. But that's bridging the gap. They don't say what the skills are. Only people who are here, the hunters, the 8%, I suspect you're absolutely right. But I'm not going to judge my model by the a group of people I don't want to go after. So that's how I just dismiss that one. Now, if you could prove it otherwise, but I just it's it's almost illogical that good people. I just I talk to them all the, every day. And I talked to a bunch of engineers two days ago. They didn't answer it that way. But uh, okay, let's kind of keep on going here. Uh, I'm gonna I'm just gonna quickly highlight this because it's very important. A, a talent pool, which is people following you, resumes in hand and talent pipelines are generally people who at one time or recently or currently were active candidates. It does not mean they're bad. It just means that they're uh, one time they were kind of in the active pool. And they might have slipped into the passive pool. However, I think we'd all agree, just from pure size, 83% is the passive side and 17% the active side, there is a disproportionate number of better people who are passive. It's not to say there aren't good people who are active. It just means there are a heck of a lot more just because of pure numbers. Uh, there's got to be seven times more than them or five, five or six times more than them in the passive pool. And I would also say that the bottom half is overrepresented in the active pool. You don't lay off people in the top quartile, uh, generally speaking, unless you're in trouble. But there are some. So that's why I say I don't want to minimize it. But that's why I think the idea of a virtual talent community is much more important. And that's really connecting through your employees to great people. And I, this is the part I mentioned earlier. If I had to say the latest technology that's coming around is connecting your employees to their best coworkers. LinkedIn is obviously leading that. They're automating that process. Jobvite is a critical player in that field. So we know that that's where the technology is in the next two to three years but they're still passive candidates. And if you post a boring message to these people, don't blame it on LinkedIn or don't blame it on Jobvite because the, you didn't, you got past uh, first base, which was get them in the game, but you dropped the ball because you, you sold them something they didn't want. So it's very important. And I'm not going to go through all the strategies in here. We'll do that. In fact, uh, just so you guys know, this was actually a two-part program. Today, introducing you this. Tomorrow, we're going to kind of dig into it a little bit deeper and give you an overview of some of the training we offer to show you how you can implement this stuff. I'll give that at the end. So don't leave. We have a that's a pretty cool thing we're going to do at the end of this program. I'll make you a pretty cool offer. Uh, but now I want to kind of talk about what re let's get down to the individual recruiter. Because when I asked the survey, I said what's critical 
uh, for getting it. And I, if you ask me what the most critical, well, actually all five of them are. A great message, which could be an email, a posting. A great recruiter who holds the deal together. Without that, it's going to fall apart. I absolutely guarantee it. Hiring manager, if you don't have a great brand, you better have a great hiring manager and a great company vision. So if the, if the, if the company is great but not well known, uh, and you got a great manager, people say, that's a great job. And I'm trying to do some work with Yahoo. I think Yahoo's got some interesting opportunities, but it's going to take a total, complete change in focus and to get these people. But you have to be a great recruiter at the game. So here's what I have uh, as a recruiter. Let me highlight it, what they are, and then I'll ask you guys in chat, what do you think are the, most, the two or three most important things a recruiter needs to be able to do? And I'll just go around it quickly. I can do the whole thing. Results driven. SWK means a subject matter expert, and HM means a hiring manager partner. Obviously, know the message, sourcing, web 2.0, networking passive. But what do you say? And let's do this for passive candidates. Some of this is active, so it's a combo hybrid model. But what are the most important drivers that a passive candidate recruiter has to have in order to work in today's world? So put those in the chat. Ramboli, assess talent and recruit and close, Swick, Swick, let's call it Swick, all knows job and messages and candidate care. Yeah, you guys got it. I mean, let's be real frank. They're all critical. You don't know the job, you, you won't be able to bridge the gap. You don't know the hiring manager, you know credibility. Uh, if, you don't, if you can't understand how to create a message that ties to that person's intrinsic motivator, it is tough to be a passive candidate recruiter because they're not looking. And the issue is if you have too much work to do, it takes time to pull this off. So here's what I've discovered. I mean, this is really what I call the core. You better know the job because that, that candidate at the moment bridge wants to tell me a little bit about the job. And they might not, you might not want to tell them right away, but you better know it when they do ask and there is appropriate time. In our training, we tell you exactly when to say it, and it's not in the first five seconds. In our, in our boot camp is we... Here's a rule we have that we'll train in boot camp. We're not going to train you today. Is you, you, every single recruiter on here, we have 103 recruiters on this call. You guys determine if you're interested in the candidate, not the candidate interested in your job. We're changing the rules. And if you don't think the candidate's right, then you're going to network with the person. But you determine that. Because if you don't do determine that, you'll never be able to network with the person. Yeah, obviously partner with the hiring manager. You can't do it alone, guys. I've made 500 personal placements. My firm made another 1,000 I was partially involved in. If you don't know the hiring manager, you cannot do it. But you've got to tame them, control them, cajole them, whatever it may be. You do have to be good at networking. And let me tell you another thing. I personally, and we train all recruiters and all those who come to boot camp, is you only call candidates who, number one, will call you back, and you only call people who are pre-qualified. So when I call a person up, I already know they're going to call me back. Because I got their name from a trusted source. I networked with that person who I just talked with an hour ago. And the person, number one, is trusted, and they already qualified the person for that job. Why would you call someone who's not going to call you back and not qualified for your job? Your LinkedIn allows you to do this. Unbelievable tool. Unbelievable. If you can't get a slate of three candidates in 24 hours, you're not using it properly. Now, you can't do anything else in those uh, 24 hours, but that's neither here nor there. You should be any job, you should be able to get three or four people in the game uh, within 24 hours, if you know how to network, that's what we teach in boot camp. But you got to be persistent. You got to influence. You got to recruit. You got to close. So let me tell you. To me, with once everyone gets linked in, and now we got 83% of the market's passive. And when the market starts heating up next year, which I finally think it's going to, recruiters will be the game changers. You guys will be the game changers if you pull it off. So. I'm not going to go through this other than tell you that it's there, and I'll let you look at the scorecard. We don't have time to do this. We have a very specific ranking system. And in our courses, we actually describe what it takes to not only rank candidates, but also yourself. And we're very specific. A level one means, hey, maybe you're competent, but you're, you're pretty far off the game. Level two is you're capable, you've done it, but you're inconsistent. And it could just be because you don't have enough uh, more time to do it. Two and a half on our scale is average. This is a three rock solid performance. Cons delivers consistent performance. Your managers trust you. Everyone's a partner. I mean, we have specific guidance. To be a level four, you got to be starting to train others. People have to reach out to you. Oh, this guy's really good. So it's recognition 
that you're by your peers that you're and your company, hey, this person, I'm coming to this person. And if you're not, if you don't have people come to you regularly, you're not a four, I guarantee you. It's just not going to happen. A five is you're sought after, you lead change, you're probably speaking at some of these major events. You're known outside of your company as a role model. And people are starting to call you, hey, this person's a, just name your friend. You want the best recruiter in the world? It's uh, Jennifer, it's Mark, it's Chuck. You know that. So we have specific ranking. What I'd like you guys to do, you can do it for your, on your own, take the score sheet, rank yourself, and send us your results. We'll give you a quick uh, call, we'll give you comments on it, whatever you can look at, and we'll pinpoint you. I don't have time to do that. I wanna, we're going to go back. I want to kind of uh, just leave it alone for now. I'm going to leave that alone. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go a little bit here. I don't want to get into this. Somehow we got uh, too engaged here. We'll cover some of it tomorrow. I want to get into social media and then open it up to questions. Probably the best way to do it, given the time frame we have here. Unless there's any other questions, come in, JJ, on any of that, that stuff we've talked about. Uh, no, we're good to go, Lou. Okay. So let me kind of describe passive candidate recruiting in the context of social media. And I believe this is another area. People believe they get into social media, ah, oh, we just got to do it. So let's put up a Facebook page, a LinkedIn page, yeah, we're in the social media. Again, it seems like we're putting a cart before it, we're just reacting to circumstances. If you have a talent-centric model in your mind, a strategy that drives everything you do, we're going after the best people, then social media, actually, hey, you can use it as a tactical tool that aligns with your talent acquisition mission, which is hire great people. So let me kind of talk about the five levels of social media from a recruiting, a, and I'll call it a passive candidate recruiting standpoint or a talent-centric recruiting model. We want to hire great people. You're a novice if you just put up basic pages, you have post boring jobs somewhere where they come to your page and they see boring jobs. There's no automatic connection between that candidate and your employees. There's little differentiation amongst you, amongst other companies. All you've got is your brand pushing it out. And you're targeting active, average active candidates. Well, that's like I tell you, okay, you're doing it. Now, most companies are doing that. Now, I'll go back. If good people aren't interested in boring jobs, whatever you're doing, it's a failure. I cannot stress that enough. It's like, okay, we want great customers to buy our products, but we'll put the worst advertising we can to kind of talk them out of it. Now, I know your company sells services or offers products. You don't say, let's find, let's advertise where people can find it and let's offer boring products so they don't want to buy it. I mean, it's like, what is the HR going on here? How can you guys think like that? Now, a minimalist, oops, a minimalist is a little bit different. You've at least got your jobs to where people can see it. And somehow the jobs are a little bit different. You've at least branded the hub. Hey, we've got some good missions. You're sending the company mission. You can see how those jobs impact the mission. You've got a basic e-program where you allow people to quickly connect with your employees. It's starting to offer some differentiation. But you're still using generic CRM, sending emails out that are kind of boring, not compelling. If you're a progressive, now you're starting to think, ah, let's go into the hub and spoke model. I call it outside in. This is the part I didn't have. An outside in ERP system, automated, is a candidate can see your jobs and automatically connected to your employee referrals. And it's automated. High level of engagement, better CRM, but you're in the game here. Now you're starting, okay, I'm in the game. You're making things happen. To get to a maven, the one thing is you have an in-out ERP system, and the jobs are clearly compelling. An in-out ERP system is really the virtual talent community. Now, and this is probably an in-out ERP. Let me just describe it versus an out-in. An out-in ERP system is the candidate finds your posting and then sees a list of employees that he or she knows in your company and tries to get a referral. An in-out, 10 times, 100 times more powerful. In-out is... You get a job posting, it looks at your employees' connections. It goes your job, your employees, to their best connections. And then there's an already a compelling email that that employee can say, yes, I want to send this email to this person, this person, this person. Automating the person's connections, not waiting for one of those connections to call the employee, but driving it proactively. Hey, you know these four great product marketing people, these two great engineers, these great business development people. Uh, are these people qualified for your job? That is huge. Huge, huge. CRM is candidate relationship management. 
It's a sales force for candidates. Uh, it's where you can send out a series of compelling messages. Uh, even CRM is now on steroids, interactive CRM, where you have a whole series of decision trees where candidates interact automatically with you. And that's the high, that's the deep. Deep perp squared, meaning your employees are proactively now reaching their coworkers, interactive CRM, fully engaged careers, fully engaged hiring managers, 100% differentiation. That's what's going on here, guys. You combine it with a talent-centric model, and you're in the game. This is the world of the future. This is, I'm going to tell you, they'll be talking about this at ERE next year, maybe not 2012, but 2013. OnRex got a new program, LinkedIn Talent Connect. This is where it's going. But you have to have a talent-centric strategy underneath it. And the core of that talent-centric strategy is a great job and a recruiter who can sell that and hold the deal together. High tech, high touch. Let me kind of leave it at that and open it up for some questions. Well, here's what I said. Perp your, no, I'm going to skip that. Uh, let me offer this and let's open up to some questions. Uh, we have a sneak peek of our training. All the stuff I just talked about was a pretty high level. Tomorrow, what time is that, JJ? 10.30? JJ, stay, yes, be with yes, me. That's, that's correct, 10.30. If you, there's our page, budurl.com slash AG events. You can sign up for the sneak peek. You got to register for it. So it's not like this. You can just come and be a lurk in the background. But we're going to talk about that. Uh, but the idea is what we'll talk about tomorrow is how do you take this into the field? Targeting the 83% passive candidate, the right workflow, the right opportunities, and we'll give you some we'll give you some examples of good messages, whether they're job postings or emails. Uh, so if you'd like to get started right away, just give us a call. We do this all the time. We go out to companies. If you even want, just call us up, send an email to info at Adler Concepts. We'll, we'll take a look at your website, career stuff, and then we'll call you up and say, we'll get on the phone, 40 minutes or so, we'll just walk you through our findings. No pure complimentary, pure exploratory. We do it all the time. Happy to do it. That's actually how we engage with everybody. We give them this, hey, do we actually do this stuff? Not, I mean, it isn't easy, but boy, you do got to be beat it over the head. And once I get a group of hiring, and sometimes I say, hey, bring some hiring managers in there. Ask them what they think. Some, bring some obstinate ones and bring some open-minded ones. Even the obstinate ones, well, this would work. Even your black and white engineers. Uh, so that's, so here's the other part we'll do. If you, have, if you think you have a good job, that's a compelling career move, just send it to info at Adler. We'll take a look at it. We'll give you some ideas on it. But let's open it up to now. Any Q&A? Uh, okay, let me answer the, the easy question first. What's CRM, SEM, and PERP? CRM is Candidate Relationship Management. A lot of uh, adventure, I guess it's a, a venture. That doesn't, I'm not thinking the right, the word doesn't sound exactly right. And uh, Boyle, Boyle, Dimitri Boyle owns a company, right? Adventure. I'm going to say that, but it's a system like Salesforce to send a series of emails to your people in your prospect pool. Interactive CRM, uh, like Infusionsoft, is a product that you can develop a decision tree so it, it becomes a, first a generic. Uh, CRM, but then based on what the candidate responds, you can actually tell or subsequent messages to it that appear to be coming from a live person. Uh, SEM is search engine marketing, and SEO is search engine optimization. Recognize you want to get your jobs to the top of the list. PERP is proactive employee referral program, getting your employees to start reaching out to the best people who they work with in the past. So when all the stuff gets automated, they're automatically connected. That would be an in-out network uh, to go to your employees. Now all this stuff is happening in real time. But you got to recognize it uh, that, hey, and maybe you almost have to take a skunk team and stop doing what you're doing now and start this new stuff. Because you can, I don't think you can actually do it in parallel with what you're doing today. It's almost like, okay, let's build a team of three or four recruiters who build a skunk organization, the elite team. They'll start changing our workflow, and then you start merging the two a year or so from now and start taking the best of the skunk team's passive candidate methodology. S&T, I don't know what S&T stands for. Oh, strategy and tactics. No. See, that's what we try to do here, put a lot of acronyms here so that people ask some basic questions. Okay, any thoughts, comments, or questions? JJ? Um, yeah, okay. do you have any ideas, yeah, do you have any ideas or suggestions on how to get around corporate police so that you can actually implement some of this stuff in a, in a, a more of a rigid corporate environment? Well, I think that's a very fair question. First off, yes. Uh, I don't think you have to actually get around. We actually work with big corporations. And I even have lawyers in the room. And I just bring my bigger lawyer in the room, who's Alyssa Horvath from Littler Mendelssohn. And she gets on the phone and she says, no, you don't have to have a boring job to do OFCCP. It doesn't say anything. She even reads the law. She litigates. 
Uh, and once you show even the corporate legal and comp the way to do it, uh, it gets in mind. So that's the, the I won't even say it's the correct way. That's a way that would work. It is it's a slow moving way, no question. The other way is to, for one search, start out with one search, one manager, and prove it. And in our training, what we do is you start with a case study, and you go through step by step by step to that case study. You engage with the manager, you find, you network, you write compelling messages, but you prove it. Then on your own, you do it. the next question. Then you do another assignment, one at a time. Then you get three or four recruiters doing it one at a time. Then all of a sudden, you group and say, geez, these six recruiters are actually getting great results, and these 20 are doing it the old way and not getting great results. And so now you have your case study, so you can actually make a presentation to the corporate bureaucrats and say, we would like to develop separate methodology that does this, and you kind of slowly move to uh, the correct phase from the bad phase. That's how I would do it. I mean, and I think that's the way to do it. And we have lots of recruiters who do it this way on their own, uh, and they, they then go to another company and they start doing that at the other company. So most of our clients are actually from recruiters who've been to another company who've done it, and then they uh, try to implement it at that company. So that's how we kind of do it that way. What a skunk team. Ah, Skunk Works was what's called uh, Lockheed Corporation when they build the X-15 model or any of their advanced uh, spacecraft. They put all of their best engineers or, and people in a different place called the Skunk Works. And it was isolate them from the corporate bureaucracy and let them go ahead. And Apple has a Skunk Works. A lot of R&D companies have Skunk Works where they do the advanced stuff and almost insulated from the corporate corporate bureaucracy. So that's what it is, trying to do something different without having to be focused on the day-to-day -day bureaucracy. So you try it out. Some of it fails, some of it doesn't fail. So that's part of it. Good question. Now. Anything else, question? Yeah, Lou. When you're talking about employee referral programs and proactive employee referral programs, do you find that companies that offer an incentive uh, do better or get better referrals than those companies who don't? And is there um, a relationship between the size of the incentives and the quality of the candidates? Oh, that's a phenomenal question. Here's what I've, I th and I, it really depends. I first heard about PERP way, uh, seven or eight years ago, but it was done differently. It was at Texas Instruments, and the recruiter there said, I've started something here at my company, just there three months, because I've gone back and I've had every new hire draw an org chart of his, her whole organization and put, uh, quality levels down A, B, C of who that person was. And then I would go call these people. And this is what the recruiter told me. He said, I would actually give, uh, for that org chart, and anybody that was hired, I would give that employee uh, the employee referral bonus. And he said, before, and I had one, one engineer who was giving me everybody at a Motorola, or whatever company it was, it might not have been that. But this guy was making like 20000 30000 a quarter. <laughs> I mean, this guy, and the recruiter was doing all the work. You know, I, I did, this guy was my... Uh, my horse, he was giving me all the people, and I just placed them. So, and he, they, so that was one way. Is that the best way? I don't know. They stopped doing it that way. I think you have to test that out. I would do it both and see what made sense. So I, I'm really, I really am an engineer, guys. Uh, it's all about testing. If I didn't think this worked and we didn't have to prove it, it wouldn't work. I'd say, throw it away, dump it. It's not going to work. But when we start studying it at the uh, process level of what works, what doesn't work, most people think, and it really, if I had to say the driver, was a great job, makes the whole process work. A recruiter who can hold the deal together can make the process work. If you don't have a great job, it doesn't work. If you've got crummy messages, you lose, you don't get enough yield up front. But, so a great job in the hands of a great recruiter who's credible, yeah, that's really what you need. At the end, you almost can, with a good job and a good uh, company, you can almost offset a weaker hiring manager. Not always, but sometimes you can. So I think you've got to test everything. That was really the point I'm making. Test it, see what works better for you, do a control group uh, with no incentive, a minor incentive, and a big incentive, and see what happens. Let's take one more question, okay, JJ, and anybody else. If you have other questions, you can certainly, uh, an incentive at Texas Instrument was like 1500 to 3000 not insignificant. And does it have to be money, or can it be some other kind of incentive besides money? No, no, that's the thing I would test. That's what you got to test. I, I, that I, uh, in my mind, I don't think it actually has to be money. You could make that a contest. I know some company was telling me they... Uh, they offered a, vac a Hawaii vacation once a quarter to whoever had the most best referrals or something. I think you make that a contest, so you can. Uh, I think there's a lot you can do with uh, what I that way. So I don't want to predict that. What I really believe, which I can't change, is a great recruiter and a great job. You'll be able to pull it off. Everything else you do, 
Uh, yeah, play with it. That's okay. But that you can't get rid of. You have a crummy job. It ain't gonna happen. No matter what incentive you give. Them. Okay. One last question. Anything great, JJ? And not ask one about the recorded. That of course is the answer. <laughs> No, I, I already answered the one about the recording. But the uh, earlier in the webinar, at the very beginning, uh, you mentioned that one of the reasons that people take a position and a reason you left a position was because of a hiring manager. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to uh, work with a position that reports to a hiring manager who might not be so popular? Um. Boy, that, we actually do talk. We have a whole segment. Our module two of recruiter boot camp is how to, in module one, how to tame your hiring manager. Uh, now, sometimes you can get them in the game to be above average, uh, and normally you can do that, and they recognize it. And we've done that a lot, all the time. If you they follow our rules of defining the work, when you have a real bad manager, I'm thinking of one, and I, and I, this sounds stupid, but and it sounds like I'm profane, but it's not. I had a hiring manager at a client. His name was Robert Schmuck, and it, that was his name, which shocked me. And I remember this about 15 years ago. And the guy was a jerk, too, aside from that. I had a world-class woman, and she was, and it was a logistics job. She was a remarkable person. It was a manager job. He was like the director of logistics and supply chain. And I just, and this woman said, I can't work for this guy. And I believed her. <laughs> I couldn't work with the guy. It was, and it, I couldn't believe anybody had a name that defined his personality. I mean, it was terrible. Uh, so I called the VP operations who gave us the assignment, and I said, you've got, to tell, you've got to protect her. And he then called her up. They met off-site. He created a career plan. He said, you really work for me, but do this. So in some way, you do have to play that game. Uh, if, and that person was a bad person. Uh, I probably could have salvaged my own career. because I, I mean, the number two guy in the client it was a Fortune 500 company. The group executive vice president was really a mentor. The executive VP was a mentor. The group president I couldn't stand. Uh, and I just I could have gone to the executive VP, and I think he would have protected me. And he even called me five years later and said, you know, to see how things were going. He knew it was, but I couldn't even tell him. I just didn't feel like killing my boss. But that's the reason I left. So I don't know if that helps you at all. Uh, but it, you do have to intervene at some level like that. And that's a true story. I mean, that guy I couldn't believe it. Um, he didn't say the name, but the guy was that personality. Hey guys, hopefully some of you are going to sign up tomorrow. Uh, I think you'll discover I, we might have a restriction. Um, do we do, we do tomorrow? Yeah, we probably have a restriction. We don't because we do we don't do it in we do it in our learning center. We actually have a tool called the Adobe Connect Learning Center, and it is restricted to 100 people. I think we had as of this morning 75 people show up. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have more than 25 more people sign up for this meeting tomorrow, and then it does. Now, usually 5 or 10% don't show up, but we might hit the limit. So if you want to get in, you got to, number one, sign up and be there at least a quarter of or 15 minutes before the class starts. Uh, so I'll leave it with you, JJ, give instructions. Hopefully this was helpful, guys. Again, don't stop here. Info at Adler Concepts, we're happy to engage with you guys. We're happy to do this stuff. But execute it.